Hey everybody, it's Norm from Tested. And Sean from Tested. Sean, we're here at one of our favorite places in the Bay Area, Tippett Studio. I love it here so much. I know, it's Phil Tippett's shop, of course, and every time we come by, he's uh, made progress on Mad God. Mm -hmm. Mad God, of course, is his obsession, his series of stop motion films he's been working so on for. All practical stuff. Yeah, yeah, for like 30 years or so. And we can also reveal that, Sean, you've been helping him out. I did a little 3D printing for him, yeah, which I was honored. Yeah. We're gonna talk a little bit about that 3D printing today, but first, let's go check in with Phil. I think he was working over there, working on some crazy creatures, uh, and see the status of Mad God. Phil, thanks for having us back. You're welcome. Yeah, I think it's been a while since we were here. Uh, you've been shooting Mad God for, for a long time now, right? Yeah, close to 30 years. 30, 30 years, on and off. Uh, what is the state of it? What's, what, what part of the anthology is it in? Uh, we finished part one and part two, and there are four parts to it. And uh, part three, we just did a Kickstarter for, mm -hmm. and have a, a good amount of it shot. It all needs to be composited and put together. Then we'll do another Kickstarter for chapter four. So for each chapter, the thing you're going for is just like this is a different type of dreamscape or? Yeah, somewhat, you know, chapter one got you into chapter two and chapter uh, two is a transition into chapter three and then chapter four is kind of its own thing, but they all relate. Mm. Do the characters go from one to each or is each chapter a way to explore different characters? Uh, there is a through line for a character that significantly changes. What are some of the characters? I noticed, like, walking in your shop, there's characters everywhere here, things you've just built that are lining the shelves, and what is, what is this guy you're working on? This was something I found online that has, like, uh, that they sell these uh, posable figures. Like pre-armatured figures? Yeah, and Holy so I'm smokes. gonna, I'm gonna kind of kit bash this thing, I'm gonna turn it into a minotaur. And uh, yeah, they've got these, uh, they're really well engineered and crafted, and they've got, you know, it's all like silicone that allows you to, or, you know, move it incrementally for stop motion purposes, and then um, this is what their skeletons look like. Oh my god. Yeah, they're pretty, pretty elaborate. That's a steel armature, like completely just prefab, out of the box, works. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then this is at, looks like sixth scale. Correct. And we know there's a ton of sixth scale toys out there that you can and buy clothing, props, accessories. Yeah, I mean, that was always part of the sort of production design for Mad God was to base everything around one sixth scale. So, mm. you know, if I, I don't have to make as much stuff. It really feels like you're downloading all these characters and creatures into a physical form. You're just kind of downloading them as fast as possible, all these different characters. Uh, and then some of the characters that you've done since you've been working on this for, for 30 years have, of course, popped in other films. Uh, this last Kickstarter, there's an interesting reward you guys did, right? Can you talk about that, that, those two chess piece characters? Yeah, well, um, Nikita, who works here, was archiving a bunch of photographs uh, that were taken when we did the original chess set. Mm -hmm. And um, she found a photograph that had a couple of characters she didn't recognize in it and asked what they were and I don't know and then uh, you know I called up John Berg who uh, I worked with to, to create the chess set and asked him if he had any memory of anything when he didn't remember and I called up Dennis Murin and he goes like oh yeah you guys made 10 and uh, uh, when you got on the set, George only chose eight hmm. because no more would fit on the chessboard. Right. And so these were the two that were that were not used. And uh, we gave them to Dennis after the show wrapped, and he held on to them for all these years. Wow. So as incentives for the part three, we um, did photogrammetry of you know the the objects that Dennis had, and then cast and mold and mold and cast and painted uh, up the little figures. Yeah, we've, we have some photos here of, of like the originals. Did they hold up well? They were never filmed, but they, they were armatured. You know, I think if you move them, they would crumble. And Dennis had them in a, in a display case for years. But yeah, this was this red one I made. 
and this green one John made. And they had aluminum wire armatures in them, so nothing very sophisticated. They weren't made to, to last beyond just, just that scene. No, we just knocked them out. Wow. Just, just quickly. We'd probably make, you know, one of these a day each. Look, looking at them back now, is it, were you happy with them? Do you feel like, like the, the look of these creatures? Like, like I was just somewhat, I mean, I, I was so indifferent to it, I forgot all about it. <laughs> yeah. And didn't remember that we had done that, so. But they still exist, like, in the same taxonomy as those characters yeah, that, that appear. Yeah, they're, they're family, so oh. they just didn't make it to the screen. Awesome. These, these will make it in the Mad God, I think? I seriously doubt it. Yeah. yeah. I don't think so. Well, thanks for letting us stop by and check out your, your miniature sculpt. Sure. So, Sean, Phil told me that they dug up these two original characters uh, that weren't used in Star Wars, but of the same family, mm -hmm. uh, from Dennis Mirren. Sean, yeah. And then yeah. uh, you worked with Mark Dubow to turn these into actual 3D printed figures. Yeah, so they did a lot of, uh, uh, they, I, got, I guess they got the originals from Dennis and they did photogrammetry. And then Mark had to process them through ZBrush and he had to pose them. Uh, digitally, and then they handed them off to me. So when you got the file, you got this like a ZBrush file. Uh -huh. Yeah, that you've had a lot of experience adapting to work on like an SLA print on a form, yeah. form printer. Yeah, the problem you run into is that um, ZBrush is awesome because they can do lots of polygons and get these really intricate meshes. So I think one, I think it was this guy, the scrimp. Um, was like 10 million polygons. And typically, if you send like a print to a service, they want it under a million. And for my purposes, I usually try to keep it three or below, because it will start to choke the, pro the slicing programs. Mm -hmm. So uh, what you have to do is decimation, where you have to basically rearrange the polygons and reduce them. So I got them down to about three million while still retaining the detail. That's an interesting point. Like, it's literally decimation. You're mm -hmm. Powers of ten, stepping it down. Yeah. Uh, do you do that in a certain way with a certain program? Or um, are you do you decrease the number of polygons in certain places to retain detail, and what, other places where you know that's not going to be as important? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're seeing decimation pop up more and more as a utility in a lot of 3D software, um, like Netfab does it, um, a Mesh Mixer, mm -hmm. uh, even, and they're even integrating into like Simplify 3D and stuff like that. The best one and the fastest one I found is still ZBrush. It has a built-in decimation thing, and it just does the best job, and it's really fast. Um, what I found is like if you decimate, say, like, like make it 20% of what it was as far as po polygon count, if you compare like a ZBrush one to like some uh, another one, the other one might look a little chunky at the same count. But ZBrush just arranges it just so perfectly. Right. Um, so I typically, even though I'm not a sculptor, I use ZBrush in the utility fashion like that, and I'll decimate in that. Now, yeah. were you given any direction as to how to print these, how many pieces to print them? Because well, this is one solid piece. Yeah, this was actually lucky. Uh, Bulbous, or Cyclops here, was able to be one piece, um, which was super easy. The scrimp. Uh, it's fairly complicated, so they, they had me chop the head. So I sliced this in net fab, and I, after decimating it, and just did these as two pieces, and I did a little hole for uh, pinning it when they're done. Um, and then uh, I was able, I positioned these both to hide the supports as much as possible. So all the ports, supports went underneath on uh, Bulbas here, and then on the scrimp, I was able to kind of like lay him on his back. And the night, the really nice thing about this is that you can um, you can really dictate how small the contact points are for the supports. So I did really small contact points. I just had to have more of them, mm -hmm. uh, but they broke off really easily. And due to the texture of these guys, they just inherently kind of hide it. Because nice. I talked to I talked to Ken and Kate who did the cleanup on these, and they're like they. Did, they didn't have to do much cleanup from the 3D prints at all, which was great. Right, so let's yeah. go check in with Ken and Kate from the model shop and see how they turn these 3D printed figurines yeah. into the collector's pieces that the Kickstarter backers are gonna get.
We're here with Kate Sabaker, who's been helping Phil on making all of the models uh, and the castings for this. You've been working with Ken Chung, who's a yes. little camera shy. Yes, yeah. Um, so let's walk through, once we had the 3D prints that I handed off to you guys, mm -hmm. what happens after that? So what we did, um, obviously there's a few different ways to make a mold, and um, we had to decide whether they were going to be a two-part mold, one-part mold, um, something like the ears, we tried to do as a one-part, and it was going to be impossible to get it out, so mm -hmm. we ended up changing that. So uh, one of the things you do is you look for where you want the sprues to be to let some air holes release. So mm -hmm. we would glue on um, bits of wire. You can see, you yeah, here. in between his arms. Um, it just allows the airflow to go through and all the bubbles to escape. Um, you can see what we ended up with for, we're calling um, this guy the, the bulbous um, <laughs> cyclops. Yeah. So we ended up with um, this two-part mold here um, where you add some registration marks so it fits together. And you can see um, through the bottom of his feet we put two tubes so that we could pour. Okay, um, right for, I got it. And then we added wires here so that all the air could escape. Um, it led to some pretty annoying sprues trying to get out of this mold. <laughs> but in, in this guy, you had uh, you just did this in one piece. Uh, yeah. And now this one, you did have me when I printed. You had I was given the model full, and then we chopped the head. Yes. Because that would be a little tricky to get the whole thing out. Yeah, especially with that sort of claw shape of the whole thing, it would be like nearly impossible. <laughs> and as it is, these shapes are kind of hard to get out without snapping these, and because it ends up getting a little more bulbous at the end there. Uh -huh. So. It's, it's best to do it in a few parts. Um, you run into the issue of how you're gonna reattach that later and wanting it to be strong, but I think we came out all, all right in the end on that one. Right. Um, you can see, so we refer to this guy as the scrimp, <laughs> um, and you can see what we ended up going with with his mold here. Um, he pours through the feet, and so as you combine these two here, we rubber band it, you pour through both of the feet, you kind of give it a little massage, uh -huh. you squeeze out the air bubbles, and when you're done, um, we just take it over the sander and sand it smooth, because that's the bottom of his feet, so he needs Let, to stand straight. You literally take the, the mold and put it on the sander? Yes. And it, it's okay. Yeah. So You gotta hold on tight, or else it's gonna fly <laughs> across the room, because it does that's, catch and the, a little. And the silicone holds up okay to that. Yeah, I, I mean, it, so. you, try, you try not to let it have too much contact, but. are Do you leave it, do you leave it in the mold so that it supports everything while you're sanding it, so yeah, it doesn't... I mean, on the one hand, that keeps it a lot stronger and more secure, but uh -huh. on the other hand, it's also because this surface here is exactly what we want his feet to be flush with. Oh, that makes sense. So if you've got that, you know, as your guide, because when you use the sander, it's easy to maybe put a little more lean on one side than I've, the other, so... I've done that, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. The, that keeps things simple. Cool, and then you were, you actually did tint the resins as well, like this is yeah, a, yeah. that was some of the scrimp resin? Yes. Some, so, so it has a little bit of pinky? Yeah, the, the resin that we started out with was a bright white, um, and we knew that because we are gonna be making so many of these, we wanted to cut down on the, you know, amount of paint that we had to use to mm -hmm. build up. So starting with something like a pink for the scrimp, and um, we have, you can see here, this was more of a almost fluorescent green that right. we did for the bulbous. Right, right, this right. was a reject. Um, and that way it just, it made it a lot easier it's to start out with. Like an automatic base coat yes, kind of thing. Yes, exactly. Okay. So then, okay, so once you had them all, uh, you had them cast, you have the feet sanded. Um, is there any additional prep that you had to do on these or did they come up pretty clean or? Um, I mean, obviously with this guy, you're gonna see there's gonna be a lot of sprues that you have to cut. Mm -hmm. um, and. You know, you'll get a little bit of seaming where the where the molds join together. Obviously, our intent was to get as little as possible, but you go through with an exacto, trim that up, yeah. maybe a little bit of a Dremel action. Um, for the most part, they're pretty, they're pretty good. I mean, we designed it in a way that we could really run through them because we needed at least you know about thirty each for mm -hmm. these. So for the, the rewards, yep. yeah. And then, uh, so then we have we have the base coat kind of molded in, and then are you airbrushing paint? Like, what's the paint process? Um, so the very f the we wanted to do a three step process. Our um, art director, uh, Mark Dubow, set this up and said, "All right, well we start already tinted. You're gonna do um, an airbrush pass, and then a wash, and then dry brush." So um, you can see here, this is our scrimp. Um, we did a, our 
our fellow model maker, Ken Chung, yep. did um, a great uh, red pass with the airbrush. And because you can make it heavier and lighter, there was already some really great shading of like, it's a little pinker in some areas. Um, so you came out red, then we gave it um, a, an umber wash. Um, you know, Phil likes to likes to get things get pretty grimy, grimy and <laughs> dirty, and he came in and said, you know, this is how I did it originally, yep. so I want this to be a bit darker. So we added that, and then we go back through with a dry brush of like a pale pink flesh color um, to really bring out the highlights and some of that texture. Awesome. Um, Kind of same process with this guy as well. So then, and then these are going to be put in little display cases. Though. Yeah, we've we've got some great um, cloche jars with bases coming, so they'll be totally sealed in glass, um, really fit for a collector to display. Awesome! I cannot wait to see the ultimate finished product. Um, thanks so much for walking us through all this and having us in the shop. Of course, I love doing this. Sean, here they are. Yep. Yeah. The scrimp and the bulbous. <laughs> uh, it's just so cool to have this. I love these guys. Tangible piece of history. Yeah. Right from the cre same creative universe as the chess pieces in Star Wars. They are of the same family. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you are a part of bringing this back to mm -hmm. back to life. Very small part, but yeah. So. <laughs> So we want to thank the team here at Tippett Studio for walking through us through that process yes. of how they pulled these from the archives and then reconstituted them through technology, photogrammetry, mm -hmm. 3D printing, and then having the artists and model makers here. Traditional ways as well. Yeah. And congratulations to those Kickstarter backers who are going to get these and put them for the in, their, God. Yeah. in their collection. Uh, Mad God is an ongoing project that Phil Tippett's working on. Parts one and two are already online. We'll have links below where you can watch those. And you Keep an eye out on their Facebook page, see when part four might be available. Yeah. And Sean and I will see you next time.